Good evening, everyone. And let's start one more time. Hopefully, this time will be the uh, magic time. And uh, welcome to the International Dermatology Education Foundation Educational Series. Tonight, we are very lucky to have Dr. Sonia Abdullah. We will discuss the dynamic skin barrier and why formulation matters. However, before we do that, I'd like to thank our supporter, Neutrogena, to make this program uh, possible for us tonight. Now, before we begin, if you are having issues hearing the webinar, you can listen to the presentation using your telephone. Just select the phone call in the audio, audio pane and the dial information will be displayed. I really am going to cut this short because we are sort of getting late and I know you guys know how this works. You're going to get your certificate of attendance within the next couple of days. And also, if you have any questions, please put the questions in the question pane and at the end, when we have time, we'll answer those. Um, as you know, uh, International Dermatology Education Foundation is a nonprofit organization whose principal mission is to raise awareness and improve dermatology care all over the world through education, especially in underserved areas. Again, you're familiar with us now, both in uh, North America and across the globe. We have done several programs in the past, and tonight we are very lucky to have Dr. Sonia Abdullah. She's double board certified cosmetic and medical dermatologist, and her office is on Dermatology on Blur, as the name says, in Toronto, Ontario, and she's going to discuss the dynamic skin barrier and why formulation matters. Thank you and welcome, Sonia. Good evening, everyone. As you can see, the theme of this evening is being dynamic. So thank you for adapting, uh, given our, our technical difficulties. So the topic for this evening will be the dynamic skin barrier and why formulation matters. We have a number of learning objectives and in the interest of time, I'm going to do my very best to be efficient to deliver these messages. And so we're going to look at the skin barrier in respect to its dynamic, sophisticated nature, look at some of the research on products, ingredients, and technologies that exist um, that are meant to be gentle, effective, and support that dynamic nature. Lastly, we're going to look at criteria that you may consider when making product ingredient or skincare recommendations to patients. So before we get into too many details on the role of the skin barrier, we're going to put up a polling question, and I'd encourage you all to, to participate. So let's look at this question. What factors do you consider when making ingredient or product recommendations to your patients? Please select one of the following. I only look for specific ingredients in a product. The formulation of the entire product matters. I reference clinical research. I have samples available to provide to my patients. Or lastly, all of the above. And so I'll give you a minute to ponder, and it'll be interesting to see what those drivers are um, in making ingredient or product recommendations to, to patients. All right. And when looking at the primary outcome for that question, all of the above is the top answer. And that's followed by the formulation of the entire product matters. So let's move ahead and we'll get back to our slides. So when we look at the structure of the skin barrier, colloquially, we're going to refer to it as this brick and mortar structure. But in the world of dermatology, we know that this is a gross oversimplification of its dynamic nature. The skin barrier, we're largely looking at the epidermis. Most of these functions are localized in the stratum corneum. So you know the skin barrier is a self-renewing, uh, self-repairing organ. You know, the skin is the largest organ of the body. Let's not forget that. But it has a number of different functions that are interconnected and co-regulated. And when we look at the long list, you know, in the, again, the most basic terms that we often communicate to patients, that skin barrier is your moisture barrier. It keeps hydration in and keeps the bad stuff out. But again, so much more than that. We know that it has antimicrobial 
function, uh, particularly related to antimicrobial defense mechanisms. It plays a role in innate and adaptive immune responses, has antioxidant functions, particularly when we're looking at uh, protecting our skin barrier against oxidative damage uh, caused by things like reactive oxygen species, and lastly, does play a role in photoprotection, particularly against ultraviolet light. And a lot of things are going to impact the function of the skin barrier. When we look at extremes of age in the population, so our patients who are youngest to those who are oldest, we know that they do have skin barrier function that is different than most of us who are here on the call this evening. Genetics will play a role. Prime example, filigra mutations in the context of atopic dermatitis. Ethnicity. So I was very interested to learn, j and has done some study looking at hydration levels um, on the face in particular. And in patients with richly pigmented skin, hydration levels are actually higher than in patients with white or Caucasian skin. And that was a learning point for me. When we look at things like climate, external aggressors, we know whether it's that cold, dry Canadian winter or, or hot, humid uh, Florida summers, that that will have an impact on your skin barrier function. Looking at body regions, so like anatomically, the legs tend to be driest. And in the world of dermatology, I think it's really important that we hone in on skincare and how that can affect skin barrier function. I'll also take a moment to highlight some of the intraday variation that exists in skin barrier function. So think about your day-to-day -day routine. You get out of bed you hit the shower, cold water, hot water, cleanser, soap, neutral pH, acidic pH, basic pH, fragrance, non-fragrance. Uh, and then you get out, you do your regular skincare routine, uh, maybe throw on some actives, your photo protection, have a cup of coffee, head out the door, deal with the stress of traffic, uh, and finally you make it to your desk. So all of these different stressors that the skin barrier is exposed to are going to affect its function. And so that dynamic skin barrier needs to be able to adapt in many different contexts. So just to highlight a couple of things on this slide, remember that transepidermal water loss peaks when you sleep, again, emphasizing the need for hydration before bed, uh, alkaline soaps, are going to impact skin surface pH and can impair barrier function. Things like DNA repair defenses are going to fluctuate throughout the day. Sebum production peaks mid midday. And again, in response to all of these stress triggers, cortisol levels are going to negatively impact skin barrier function. So what do we do? Well, this is where we look for skincare solutions that are going to be designed to respect and complement that dynamic skin barrier function. We're gonna take some time to look at both cleansers and moisturizers. Remember, these are a marriage, right? You should never be thinking about a cleanser uh, without thinking about a moisturizer. So this is where we're gonna focus next. Cleansing is a common act, and cleansers can cause damage to skin barrier lipids, including decreases in things like ceramides, proteins, and NMF. Cleansers or soaps that are particularly um, at a higher pH are going to increase transepidermal water loss, activate protease function, and trigger exfoliation or desquamation of the skin. All of these are going to contribute to inflammation and oxidative stress which clinically presents as itching, burning, uh, skin barrier impairment. And as part of my intake form in my clinical practice, I have a few questions that I'd like to put to patients. And one of them is, what type of cleanser do you use? And I'm always surprised when I hear the answer. So uh, cleansing has evolved over time. And this is a very interesting schematic um, that looks at the different types of soaps that have evolved over time. And if you look at 3000 BCE, we're looking at DIY soaps. Now, those still exist in our day and age, but they have certainly progressed since then. And some of my patients still come in and they're very proud to tell me that they are using a glycerin soap. But you'll see those came out in the 1940s. 
And since then, we have a number of different options, syndet soaks, uh, conditioning biodegradable liquids, and it does bring us to today, which is the day of HM polymer cleansers. So surfactant-based cleansers, so these are classic cleansers uh, that are meant to rid the skin of things like debris. They typically are made of both a surfactant monomer and a micelle. So think of those micelles, they're meant to be little Pac-Mans that uh, act at the surface of the skin, chomping up things like debris, dirt, um, skincare products. But cleansers may actually be left behind on the skin and not rinsed away completely. When they're left behind on the skin, they can remain and disrupt skin barrier function. When this occurs, we are looking at um, a depletion of skin barrier components, and this skin barrier impairment can trigger things like inflammation, oxidative stress, and cell signaling that, again, clinically presents as erythema, pruritus, burning sensation. Patients will describe it as a tight feeling um, and, and overall uh, uncom uncomfortable uh, sensations. So I'll draw your attention to the diagram on the screen. So at the right of your screen, um, you'll see two different schematics. On the left, the representation of the surfactant-based cleanser, and on the right, the HMP technology cleanser. So HMP stands for hydrophobically modified polymer. So this cleansing technology is meant to be a form of effective cleansing that is going to maintain skin barrier function and minimize its disruption. The idea with HMP cleansers, you're meant to minimize surfactant penetration so that the product can cleanse the skin but be rinsed away completely. This significantly reduces transepidermal water loss and has been shown in a number of studies. When looking at the experience of a product, because it's great to have data on clinical efficacy and safety, but when it boils down to it, there has to be a consumer element uh, in terms of the experience using the product. So this was a consumer study that was conducted by J&J, &J, a group of healthy women between the ages of 25 and 54 with a number of inflammatory skin conditions, things like atopic dermatitis, acne, and rosacea. And they were randomized to one of two groups, either for use with the cleanser with HMP technology or a benchmark gentle cleanser. And they were asked a number of different, uh, asked about a number of different features related to these particular cleansers. Did it clean the skin without leaving residue? Was it able to remove things like dirt, oil, and makeup? Um, did it leave the skin feeling smooth, completely clean afterwards? And how did the skin feel after? Did it over dry the skin? Um, and, and again, what was that, that cleanliness factor? And so when looking at the HMP cleanser technology relative to the benchmark gentle cleanser, the HMP technology did outperform on all of those parameters. And so the cleanser that we're referring to with the HMP technology is the Neutrogena Ultra Gentle Daily Cleanser. And again, it is a cleanser that preserves the skin's moisture barrier. It's been evaluated in many different trials, so 14 clinical studies uh, with over 800 subjects. And it's been tested in as a primary test product in combination with other therapy. So overall, an effective cleaning solution for patients um, that is meant to preserve skin barrier function while giving that uh, positive aesthetic uh, experience. And so let's go back to that marriage, the marriage of cleansers and moisturizers. So cleansers, we want to make sure that the barrier is uh, maintained. And emollients or moisturizers, we are meant to restore skin barrier function. So in the world of dermatology, we have a number of different moisturizer categories. We have emollients, we have occlusives, and we have humectants. So when looking at the occlusive properties of a moisturizer, again, these function by basically putting a layer of oil on the skin uh, and slowing transepidermal water loss. 
When we look at humectants, these are meant to draw hydration uh, from the deep dermal water, uh, deep dermal levels to increase the skin's water holding capacity. And then again, looking at emollients, not only do they have some of these properties, but they're also going to have smoothing effects, filling the gaps between corneocytes to smooth the skin. I would be remiss if I didn't touch on the topic of ceramides when talking about moisturizers. Ceramides are certainly having a moment in skincare, and they are certainly a buzzword that are well recognized, or a word that is well recognized by uh, clinicians and by our patients. But the question ultimately becomes: When ceramides are applied to the skin, do they actually penetrate through the stratum cornea? And on the right of your screen, you'll see this was a diagram that was pulled uh, from a publication from the JAD published in 2021, looking at uh, ceramide application versus small chain fatty acids uh, and looking at their penetration into, uh, into the, the epidermis. And when looking at fatty chain, uh, pardon me, small fatty acid absorption relative to ceramides, it was found that long chain ceramides did have as good penetration into the skin as the small fatty acids, but short, short chain ceramides did not. So we've learned over time that it's not only important to understand what is the active ingredient, but what is the quality, what are the specifications of those ingredients that will give patients the efficacy that they're looking for in their skincare products. And so when we look at Neutrogena Hydro Boost, this is where I'm going to spend a little bit of time this evening highlighting the key ingredients that are included in the formulation for clinical efficacy and the positive uh, aesthetic experience. So Neutrogena Hydro Boost has a unique liquid crystal gel matrix, and there are three primary components, hyaluronic acid, and we all know hyaluronic acid, well known for its water holding uh, capacity, its hydroscopic capacity. Glycerin, a strong humectant that does penetrate through nine layers of skin surface for long lasting hydration in this formulation. And then lastly, olive oil derived emulsifiers. And these emulsifiers form liquid crystals within the formulation that are meant to mimic or replicate the skin surface lipid barrier organization. And you'll see in the schematic on the left of your screen that representation of the epidermis, the top layer stratum corneum, and how the hyaluronic acid is going to bind to water, how the uh, emulsifiers basically penetrate between the corneocytes, filling those gaps and replicating the lipid bilayer. So again, we've got three components and the, the name of the product line, the Hydro Boost, really does focus on skin hydration. So let's look at these confocal Raman images. On the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Hydro Boost uh, represented as the gel matrix moisturizer, and it is being compared to a leading uh, moisturizer on the market as well as untreated skin. And so this is looking at relative water content in viable epidermis. Red represents hydration. And so in the gel matrix moisturizer, relative to the untreated control, we're seeing an 86% increase in relative water content. Uh, and when the gel matrix moisturizer is compared to the leading moisturizer as the comparator, there is 33% better hydration using the gel matrix moisturizer. So again, going back to these strong hydration levels for skin barrier replenishment. And again, it's more than just hydration. We want to know what is happening at a gene expression level. So we've learned this from a lot of different ingredients in skincare. And, you know, J&J have done a lot of research, um, particularly with um, Aveeno and Oath-based products, but also in the realm of Neutrogena. So on the left of your screen, we're looking at, again, gel matrix moisturizer in blue compared to a benchmark ceramide containing moisturizer in yellow. And again, on your left, you're looking at gene expression for ceramide synthesis following 48-hour induction treatment. And again, the gel matrix moisturizer in terms of uh, ceramide gene expression 
ceramide synthesis gene expression doesn't perform the benchmark ceramide containing moisturizer. And similar is seen with keratinocyte differentiation genes. We also want to know about endogenous ceramide production. And this is what's represented on the right of your screen uh, following daily use of either the gel matrix moisturizer or the competitor moisturizer. And after four weeks of daily use, we are seeing an uptick in endogenous ceramide protection um, with the gel matrix moisturizer again outperforming the benchmark. So neutrogena hydroboost, we're very familiar with it. We know that it exists in its original formulation as well as the extra dry, and it has also expanded into skincare. So the therapeutic benefit, the clinical efficacy, balance with the aesthetic appeal for patients. The last portion of this evening's presentation is going to focus on an ingredient that we all know very well that is a hero ingredient in skincare when it comes to dermatology, and that's going to be retinol. So retinol has been around in dermatology since the early 1900s when it was discovered. But remember, you know, research and development was slow, and this was largely related to the instability of the molecule. We, we, we know this as dermatologists. We know that there is an element of, of instability. It's partly why we always look for opaque uh, containers, dispensers, and also instruct patients to use retinols and retinoids before bed. And so it wasn't until the 1990s where the skincare industry uh, started to develop innovation in the retinol market, and this led to more and more interest, and eventually Neutrogena was the first to launch stabilized retinol products. And when we think about therapeutic indications, we've got the common things that come to mind photoaging, acne, but remember retinol, retinoids, we use them to even complexion, sometimes for in the context of wound healing, even even with our rosacea patients. So a lot of different uses in the dermatology space. When looking at vitamin A metabolism, remember it is a, there is a metabolic pathway and retinol is not the endpoint. So we have precursors to retinol, which um, those precursors are retinol palmitate. Again, that's converted to retinol and eventually retinaldehyde, retinoic acid. And the importance of retinol and retinoids are related to its uh, impact at the nuclear level. Remember, it does modify gene expression. And that's partly why it is such an impactful ingredient in skincare. When we think about the metabolic pathway of vitamin A, this is a really great schematic that is showing us the spectrum of retinol on the market. So again, to the left of your screen, you have retinol ester, which is the precursor to retinol, and all the way to your right, you have retinoic acid. And so when looking at this spectrum of availability, you'll see for those that tend towards the right of your screen, we have increased potency, but with that also comes increased irritation potential. When you shift to the left of your screen, where we have the retinal esters, we have increased stability. And so where we gain in one, we may lose on the other. So ultimately, we are looking for things like clinical efficacy, tolerability, and stability to really look at a, at a formulation that will win for our patients. There's a lot of misunderstanding, misrepresentation when it comes to retinol, particularly when we're looking at mass market. Um, for some of our patients, they do have concerns related to retinol use because they're afraid that it's going to thin the skin. And it's a complete total opposite. Um, you know, there is an exfoliant effect when we're looking at keratinization and keratinocyte proliferation, but most of the benefits occur at the dermal level. <laughs> Recall we have upregulation of TGF beta that stimulates uh, glycosaminoglycans as well as elastin and collagen production, and we are enhancing dermal repair mechanisms and dermal cell proliferation. All of these mechanisms all occur while suppressing the function of our MMPs, which do degrade collagen and elastin. 
So the next few slides are going to look at some of the in vivo studies that have been done with retinol versus vehicle. And I'll share this one in particular with you that is looking at glycosaminoglycan production over a 24 week period. So on the left of your screen, comparing retinol versus vehicle, you'll see after 24 weeks, there is relative induction of glycosaminoglycan production, the most common being hyaluronic acid. And these are the tissue explant representations, again, vehicle versus retinol um, over a 24-week period. And when looking at cell proliferation in the context of retinol versus control, um, looking at cell replication in terms of KI67 staining and fibroblast overgrowth, um, you will see that these are all upregulated in response to 48 hours of uh, retinol exposure. And all of this is leading to epidermal thickening. Again, collagen elastin expression does increase in response to retinol exposure, and our MMPs, particularly MMP1 and MMP9, um, are downregulated. And I think this is a great example of the time that it typically takes for patients to see these types of clinical uh, benefits. You'll see that at baseline, um, to the left of all of these stainings, we're having our, our, our baseline kind of benchmark starting point, but we're really evaluating these things further out, 24 weeks. And I think that's a very important thing that we have to emphasize to patients, for patients who have a tendency to trade out their skincare very quickly because they want to see a benefit uh, sooner, faster, we're not going to get there quickly. This is the long game. And again, it, it's upon us to remind our patients uh, and set those expectations. So again, we're looking at the spectrum of bioactivity, identifying those key molecules that can eventually be developed into formulations that are going to be innovative and lend themselves to the clinical efficacy that all of our patients are looking for. And this brings me to the Neutrogena Rapid Wrinkle Repair line. And this is the product, uh, product line that we're going to focus on for the next few slides, looking at clinical outcomes. This is a good representation because it, we all know that there are a number of different retinol products on the market. And when looking at retinol bioactivity, one of the markers that we can look at is CRAB BP2, so cytosolic ret uh, retinoic acid binding protein 2. And its expression is a marker of, uh, of bioactivity. On the left of your screen in red, you have uh, the Neutrogena Rapid Wrinkle Repair Night Cream, and that's being compared to Crab BP2 levels uh, to different prestige brands that you may carry even in your own practice. An imitator, mid green in orange, and then some of these Maxtige type products um, that many of our patients have been exposed to um, that are often very accessible but don't always have the clinical efficacy that comes along with it. And you can see that as, as it's reflected by the Crab BP2 expression levels. And while the molecule is important, we also know that there are ways to boost efficacy. And this is where Neutrogena Rapid Wrinkle Repair really does excel. At the bottom of your screen, again, looking at CRAB BP2 levels um, in terms of mRNA in epidermal cells, in blue, you have a non-treated control, in red, retinol, and in green, retinol with Mertis extract. And so Mertis extract is uh, derived from the Mertis flower. And this is the 1-2 combination that's used in Neutrogena Rapid Wrinkle Repair that has a synergistic effect. So that Mertis extract in combination with the retinol is able to boost the effect of retinol without having to make any other modifications to the formulation for both efficacy and tolerability. There's also an element of vehicle that is going to play a role. And when looking at um, our prescription market, we know that there's some evolution that's been made uh, in terms of vehicle in which retinoids are suspended. But 
a lot of innovation is coming from the OTC market as well. And when looking at this key vehicle that's in the Neutrogena Rapid Wrinkle Repair product, we're able to slow the penetration or slow the release of retinol into the skin to mimic, pardon me, to minimize skin irritation. And that is the schematic on the left. Again, the polarity of the retinol molecule is also going to affect the diffusion rate. So again, not only important to have the correct molecule, ways to boost efficacy while maintaining tolerability, but then also a way that it can be delivered to the skin in an effective and safe manner for patients. And now we're going to tip into the clinical data, which again, I think is something that really is important both for us and to patients. So four primary outcomes that we're looking at here, and these are the results of a double-blind eight-week study of 40 female patients between the ages of 40 and 69 who were using Neutrogena Rapid Wrinkle Repair Night Moisturizer once daily before bed. And the four outcomes that we are looking at are fine lines, crow's feet, coarse under eye wrinkles, and sallowness. And the outcome was mean percent improvement over time. And at the top of this graph, you're seeing outcomes for global scores, so fine lines and sallowness that do improve quickly uh, early on in the study and to a, a greater degree than the periocular outcomes, so crow's feet and coarse under eye wrinkles. And while we do see a difference in kind of specific and global outcomes, we are seeing that trend that continues to improve throughout that eight-week period. And when we look at it, like eight weeks is a short period of time in the world of dermatology. It's not a short time for our patients, but it is a short time for us. We are also interested in those long-term follow-up outcomes, so the 52-week outcomes. And this is what is represented here. So we're looking at, again, retinol versus vehicle uh, for wrinkle parameters and pigmentation parameters. And you will see after 52 weeks of use, there is significant improvement with all of the retinol, uh, retinol based outcomes relative to, to vehicle for things like forehead wrinkles, under eyes, crow's feet, uh, and even cheek wrinkles. And when looking at complexion based outcomes, particularly things related to pigmentation, evenness uh, of skin tone, overall skin tone and photo damage, again, very encouraging results. When looking at this from an absolute uh, numbers perspective, again, your overall photo damage has improved 36% from baseline. And keep in mind, for patients to be able to recognize objective change, the human eye on average needs about 30% change to be able to say, yes, no, this has made a difference. So again, in terms of overall photo damage, 36% improvement, 44% improvement in crow's feet, and that model pigmentation, 84% improvement. So again, very, very positive uh, response over 52 weeks. And so we do have to encourage patients to stick with this for the long game. And then lastly, the item that's highlighted at the bottom of the left of your screen, over 52, over 50% of patients had a more than two grade improvement in severe wrinkle and pigmentation parameters. As a final portion of this evening's presentation, I would be remiss if I did not speak to you about acne. And remember, retinol is an ingredient that is used not only for treatment of photoaging and complexion-based outcomes, um, particularly pigmentation, but also for acne and for the sequelae of acne. When I consider my patients with richly pigmented skin in my practice, it's not only the acne that is impactful to them and meaningful to treat, but it's also the residual outcome of the acne. So the macular hyperpigmentation and the hypertrophic scarring. And when looking at patients with richly pigmented skin, this is a study that was conducted by J&J &J, and close to 50% of Asian patients uh, or those um, who identified as Hispanic or black had more than 50% um, more than 50% were experiencing macular hyperpigmentation of acne. So 
very, very relevant to our patients, again, not only to treat the acne, but to treat the sequelae of it. And I'll share with you new additions to the Neutrogena portfolio um, when it comes to acne. So a two-step uh, routine for patients. A 2.5% micronized benzoyl peroxide meant to be used as field therapy in the morning for patients in acne-prone areas, and a secondary step uh, for the evening, which is retinol-based. And you'll see the retinol S. A, the sustained action, so that is what the SA refers to, um, that is meant to specifically target the residual uh, macular hyperpigmentation of acne with the morning really targeting the, the inflammatory process. So again, one, two combination, patients like systems. And so this is a good way to, to operationalize that for them. And again, uh, this is a consumer study looking at response to treatment with the Neutrogena Severin Acne Marks, uh, pardon me, Severin Acne and Severin Acne Marks uh, protocol, so the AM and PM formulations. So on the left of your screen, looking at acne breakout improvement, and on the right of your screen, looking at an even pigmentation and imperfection. And so you'll see that patients did respond to treatment positively early on um, with the acne parameters responding more quickly. Again, that is related largely to the benzoyl peroxide and the more sustained improvement over time in response to the retinol. Uh, again, looking at evenness of, uh, of pigmentation and, uh, and imperfections. So again, another good option for our patients who are looking for um, either add-ons to prescription treatments or alternatives. And in some cases, this may also be an entry point in terms of managing their acne. So thank you for staying with me. We have uh, managed to cover a lot of ground in a short period of time. In terms of a few key takeaways for this evening's session, I do want to remind you uh, about the dynamic nature of our skin barrier and the way that it functions and how those functions do uh, interconnect. Having this understanding is really going to lead to more innovation in the skincare space and ways that we can uh, complement our skin barrier function and provide that clinical efficacy paired with the aesthetic experience. And as a last key uh, takeaway, the few things that I would ask that you keep in mind when making these product recommendations to patients, there are going to be considerations around elements such as bioactivity, clinical stability, or product stability, I should say, uh, the cost of the product, the aesthetic appeal, the availability on the shelf, uh, because again, that means fewer callbacks for you and your practice, and lastly, the safety and clinical efficacy um, that has been typically evaluated in clinical trials. And as we wrap up this formal session, I am going to put one last polling question to the group. And so moving forward, will you consider the overall formulation of the product when making recommendations to your patients? And I'd ask that you select one of the following. Yes, I did not in the past, but will do so in the future. Yes, I already considered how a product is formulated. No, not in the past and don't think I will in the future. And lastly, unsure, I'd still like to learn more. So take some time to reflect on that. I know that there are a lot of different drivers that are going to, to impact the way we consider clinical data, consider formulation, uh, particularly as it's, uh, it's put forth. And I think it's something that is important for us uh, to really take into consideration when making those recommendations. And so I'm happy to share with you the results of the poll. And for the vast majority, so over 90% of, of people on the call tonight, um, yes, you did not uh, consider formulation in the past, but you will do so in the future. But many of you are already thinking about formulation when making these recommendations. So again, as we continue to move forward, I think this is really important uh, for, for all of us as clinicians and again, for our patients.
And so I like to thank all of you for your time uh, and for sticking with us uh, in uh, on this dynamic uh, call. And uh, despite some of the challenges that we had early on, I think uh, we've managed to to give people back a portion of their evenings. Not only you managed to give some portion of the evening back, but we also have some questions and we do have time actually uh, another couple of minutes to answer some of the questions. So one of the question comes actually from a very good friend of mine uh, and she is asking, can you comment on Bakuchiol as a retinol alternative? Data supports upregulating collagen and tropoelastin. Does it decrease MMPs uh, one and nine? So excellent question. And when we look at the market and where Bakuchiol is coming from, it's a botanical. So we're still learning about it. And I agree there is some evidence to show upregulation of things like elastin and collagen. We don't know enough about MMPs. We don't know enough about gene expression to know how it fully performs. And my hope is that as the market continues to grow, we, we learn more, particularly about some of these botanical products and ways that they can either be uh, paired or married with what we're currently using um, or, or used as an alternative. Patients love options, right? And at the end of the day, it's not one size fits all. So I don't have a straight answer related to MMPs, but my hope is that we can generate more data and, and learn more. The next question is really a very practical but a very important one. Do you advise over-the-counter retinol to pregnant patients? It's an excellent question. Um, and I wear a couple of different hats. You know, I wear a hat as a mom who's had a baby and loves retinol and retinoids, um, but I also wear it as a, as a clinician. And despite um, us knowing what we know as clinicians, I, I don't actually think there's a lot of safety risk, but we also know that pregnancy is a very unpredictable time. When we look at the rate of first trimester losses, it can be up to 20%, right? So uh, again, I tend to err on the side of caution and do not use retinol or retinoids in pregnancy. Actually, I don't either. We have a, a little bit of different climate here in the U.S. because of the medical legal. You have less, Absolutely. but I think it's better to be safe than sorry. I completely agree for, on, on all different counts, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, another question is, and this is my favorite, overall formulation matters. You know my uh, motto is, right? Vehicle matters. But what is it exactly that ensures the formulation is optimal and efficacious? It's a great question, right? So we're looking at a molecule, right? And, and you need to have key molecules. And we've seen it here with rapid wrinkle repair, where, ways that we can boost the efficacy while promoting the tolerability. And with all of these ingredients in skincare, I think it becomes a it becomes a balance, right? We want to have good efficacy, marrying it with the tolerability. And when we're looking at things like vehicle, if you have a vehicle that again promotes stability with your tolerability, you have a winner, right? But where we sometimes have one thing, we lose on another. And so we don't want to do one thing at the expense uh, of another. So so I do think you, the formulation really does matter. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's absolutely, it's a very difficult balance to achieve, right? Uh, we want that uh, active ingredient to penetrate the stratum corneum, but not to be absorbed. We want that tolerability, and it's very difficult balance to achieve. Um, so, but lately we've been very lucky with all the new formulations, right? So it's 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 good for dermatology for topical era. Um, another question is sort of relevant to this: Does a higher concentration of an active ingredient mean in a product is it more efficacious or not? Great question. Uh, my answer to that is no. 
right? I don't think it's all about the number, right? It's not all about the concentration. Um, there are ways that formulations can be modified to improve efficacy without necessarily playing with the concentration. Uh, and, and we know this not only from our, our prescription treatments, but also in the, the realm of, of our OTC skincare options. Yeah, exactly. You know, I always say you can have the best active, but if it sits on the skin, it's not going to do any good to anybody. Absolutely. Um, finally, I think we have a couple of more minutes that it will be a nice way of to finish this question. We'll summarize most of the stuff that you said. Uh, they're asking you name several factors that can influence the skin barrier, but what are the key top three or so? I should always be mindful of one when making regimen and product recommendations. I think it's a it's a really good question because so many things are going to go into play in terms of, of making those recommendations. And at the end of the day, you know, the things that are going to allow my patients to tolerate the formulation better. Um, so you know, looking at things like um, extremes of age, climate. Um, Sometimes even uh, things like dermatologic comorbidities. Do they have atopic dermatitis, rosacea, all of these different things. Um, the things that are going to, to dictate the tolerability of my therapeutic, to me, are the most important ones because I can have the most effective product. If my patients don't tolerate it, then it's just not as helpful to anybody, right? And they won't be able to, to benefit from it. So I do think those key factors um, that are going to, to dictate um, tolerability are the ones that, for me, are most important. Absolutely. Well, I think we are right on the top of the hour, and I thank you so much for this wonderful eye-opening lecture, and I thank our uh, supporter, Neutrogena, again tonight for making this program possible. I apologize again for the uh, beginning technical difficulties, but we got it made. So thank you so much, and have a good evening, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night.